hello and uh, very, very welcome here for our symposium as a parallel event for the exhibition Our Ecology. And before I'm going to introduce the speakers and also my co-curator, I would just want to inform you about a couple of uh, ideas which are behind that exhibition we made here in the Mori Art Museum. And uh, we were elementary inspired by a historian from India and whose name is Dipesh Chakrabarti. And to explain you what exactly ex inspired us, I'm telling you a brief story from the book Moby Dick from Herman Melville. Because in the end of this book, the whaling boat Pecot enters Japanese water and it is immersed in the region's dazzling brightness of the sun. The main character, Captain Ahab, obsessed with a revenge plan against the mythical white whale that left him one leg in an epic fight, he adjusts his in navigation instrument towards the sun and keeps his body upright by balancing out the water. And actually this Multitasking serves as a proper metaphor for what we are permanently doing all the time. Calculating our position, improving our situation, which Dipresh Chakrabarti would call global. But then Dipresh Chakrabarti also speaks about the planetary as a non-exclusive opposite, and that is represented by the balancing out of the water with his body. And in thinking about this exhibition, we started to think about what is actually ecology. Ecology came up in the 19th century. And it is a term which in the beginning was repeatedly used parallel with economy. Ecology and economy were used as more or less the same. But as far as it looks, the global environmental crisis gives the impression that the looking into the sun, the optimizing, the growth, the expansion, that that was done over the last 200 years or 500 years, whereas the planetary to coexist with this planet, which is yeah, represented by balancing out your body, that that was probably not done enough. And due to that reason, this is a bit our thesis that the economy is now our ecology, or the economy of some is the ecology of all. Um, this is a bit uh, what inspired our thinking, and from there we also used ecology as an extended term. We departed from the fact that humans themselves are microbiota, and we make from there connections to social life, to politics, to science in our exhibition. To, so it's, ec ecology is for us just a burning glass. In our show, we try to bring post-war avant-garde together with contemporary art to cover actually the last 50 years, the moment of time when the limits of growth were so to articulate it first time, but also the here and now where something simple as the weather is not at the end of daily news, it is dominating the news. It's all about the weather, climate migration, climate justice. Um, so this was also an interesting point for us to think about. We also try in this exhibition to show a little dance of post-colonial thinking and post-humanist thinking. I think later our speakers, then we will be, get a bit closer to it because it does not go always so good together, post-colonial thinking and post-humanist thinking. And then an important question for us was also, will the use of technology which brought the world in this crisis, will this help us out? We won't find an answer here, but these questions inspired us. And above all, of course, an exhibition is, we make this exhibition for artists because artists are able to mediate between what I told the global and the planetary in the beginning. Artists are able to do that and they are the best in that. Artists also can help us of giving water, animals, plants, non-human beings an agency. They make these processes tangible and visible. They can also enhance collectivity, reactivate overseen knowledge, 
also indicate directions of growth, speaking from here, from the 90, 49th floor. And uh, so art is for us a tool to formulate doubt, but also hope, and to do that at the same time. And this is where this exhibition is about. And uh, now I'd like to, amongst many other things, and now I would like to introduce you to the really excellent, and I'm very happy to, to, that we could get these wonderful guests, people who since a very long time work already with that issue. So, because, uh, um, yeah, it's in the international art scene, not just now a theme, it is already, it's an ongoing thing and it culminates at the moment, is my feeling. So, appearing, um, we start with the person who's most distant. This is Nicola Bourriot, who is the artistic director of the 15th Gwangju Biennale, amongst other things. Here next to me is Yuko Hasegawa, the director of the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art in Kanazawa. Then Shus Martinez, uh, head Institute Art, Gender, Nature at Basel Academy of Art and Design. And then my co-colleague, my co-curator, Reiko Tsubaki, with whom I worked on that exhibition. And um, Reiko will give now an, a more deeper introduction in our show, and afterwards the colleagues will come with their presentations, then we will have a discussion, and then we will have a discussion all together. Thank you very much. So from now, I'd like to talk about this, uh, our ecology toward a planetary living. I'd like to introduce our exhibition. Well, first of all, uh, me and also Martin, and also the chapter two is curated by Bart Winder Tamaki. And we have four chapters throughout this exhibition. The first one is All is Connected. And uh, yes, we have the uh, thin biosphere on the surface of the globe, and it's connecting everything, not just organic materials, but inorganic materials such as data. So uh, this is uh, shown at chapter one. Uh, we have uh, artists who are demonstrating and exhibiting those issues. The first is uh, Hans Harke. Uh, he, uh, is, uh, he is uh, quite an important conceptual artist. So uh, just like system, this is a cultural of the storm and also science. Maybe the animal plants as well as weather information are utilized uh, to really create a one phenomena. And this is described as a pictures uh, by Hans Hage. And also, Nina Kanel. So, if you have gone to the exhibition, I think uh, many of you have already have. Uh, when you you can immerse yourself into the artwork. And this is the scallop shell, uh, five tonnage altogether, carried from Hokkaido, Northern Island. And by walking on this shell, it pulverizes. It becomes a powder. And then that is going to be utilized as a construction material. And this uh, scallop shell is a big, big issue and problem for the fisheries. And as you can see, to make it clean and bring it over, you utilize petroleum, petroleum, so therefore in itself, it is not so kind to the environment, but the Neil Canel has wanted you to, to experience this intentionally, so to understand the situation. So the muscle memory, which is a title, is uh, when you walk on the shell, it's a memory of your muscles, how you feel crushing the shell. And Cecilia Bicunia, the third uh, artist, so she is uh, an indigenous. Uh, she's not any from the indigenous uh, uh, people, but uh, it's keep gilok. So it is a 
knots and and this uh, culture. It's a way of communication. It's a symbol. It's like a glimpse. And when you have one knot or two knot, it's a symbol. So you need to a uh, way of tracking and recording the number. So under the colonialization of the Spanish rule, those of course, legend, legendary uh, work are being forgotten. This is a Wanju Benale. She uh, worked on this. It's like a kimono, and it is utilized for that purpose. The textile and and this uh, c- culture utilizing the glimpse of the uh, knot or nexus uh, tied on to this text. Uh, Johan Lambert, she, he is a biologist. And from his eyes, uh, in the city and urban environment, a lot of uh, plants and fauna, very beautiful, very delicate, but uh, it is looked upon if it has been supervised and monitored, so it's in the form of an installation. And Abhijapon Virasetakun uh, in Khan. Uh, won the Palmador, well, well-known Thai uh, film producer, director, and it's called Night Colony. In a dark room, or dark or lo- in a single room, there's a bed in a house, and white uh, bed linen under a very bright light. You see a lot of insects and butterflies and moth gathering. And when you see them, you see that their colonies, partially you see increase and decrease, and the night colony is the human. Its bed is where you utilize when you go to sleep. But it seems as though the insects are creating their own colonies. At the same time, humans on this planet, before we are even born, insects did exist. So therefore, it's the humans that are creating colonies that used to belong to this insect. So this is uh, shedding a light on many of those thoughts altogether. And Emilia Shikarinu Ritte. So this is Arrow of Time, is a title. So she's from Lithuania and it, it visu- uh, video, well, video, a very large immersive experience through her video works. And uh, mainly comprises of three scenes. One of them is just, you can see, a very beautiful uh, video in Nap- Nap- Nepal. It, there is a sunken Roman uh, city, and she herself is uh, dressed like a mermaid and utilizing her own body. She's mentoring, and uh, it's a civilization against nature, how vulnerable they are against nature. And there are two other scenes that are being shown, but one of them is in Lithuania, like Chernobyl. It's the same type of nuclear power plant. It's already uh, decommissioned, not utilized. And there are snakes that are swimming, but the swimming uh, a snake is now is a, not an evolutionary chronological time, but it's a reverse of time. And with the computer graphic, the underwater, a cloud data server immersed under the water. So cloud server data in the under the water, there are some. She has said that already have the equipment installed underwater, but it's very dangerous. If somebody ha- something happens, it's uh, prone to break. So a large chronological time, understanding civilization, and mermaid for her is from the myth, and uh, at the same time, a living organ that is uh, futuristic. It's no gender, not male or female. So that is how she looks at it. So this is chapter one. Chapter two is Return to Earth, and 1950s to 1980s, the art and ecology in Japan. So under this title, uh, we have guest curator, Professor Bart Windsor Tamaki uh, worked on the curation of this chapter. So in Japan, uh, with a great amount of economic development, there was serious issue about pollution. Many things have happened, environmental issues uh, were very severe then. And for instance, the first uh, work, this is the the fifth uh, happy dragon ship incident. So the nuclear power 
were,、uh, there was an experiment in the Sun Pacific, and it, these fishermen were involved. And then the ship name was、uh, Lucky Dragon. And,、uh, Oka, Okamoto Taro and Katsura Yuki have written、uh, these paintings based upon this incident that have happened. And、uh, documentary films also are on increase. In this latter part of the 60s around the world, Japan was the most advanced nation in terms of pollution. And、um, on the left,、uh, Fujiko Nakaya、uh, is uh, quite famous for a, a mist sculpture, a fog sculpture. So she had. Advocated、uh, this、uh, movement in order to document the protest against Minamata disease. And、uh, Koryu Ryoji, this is、uh, the title of the section called Return to Earth. The human will ultimately, can they return to Earth? So he was very keen about looking into the radiation issue. And he himself is buried in the, in the soil. And、uh, it is from Tokoname in Aichi Prefecture. So This is Kudo Tetsumi in Paris,、uh, already lived in Paris.、Uh, this is a cultivation by radioactivity. A very small,、uh, interesting eyeballs and flowers, and it's、uh, proliferating. And it's quite a unique work. And Muraoka、uh, Mitsuro, Saburo, excuse me. And、uh, there are、uh, some flies uh, in uh, this, and、uh, there are experiments that are being conducted. Conducted. So、uh, the title is College of Flies and Their Moments, but it's a grid box, shows a modernity.、Uh, but、uh, the humans, in terms of the pollution issues, living in this pollution, and in the box, there are some flies that are living. It, it could be a metaphor towards that. And also, the, in terms of the elemental. Materialities.、Uh, this is、uh, Tonosaki Tadashi and、uh, Taguchi Gaho. Tonosaki Tadashi and、uh, in Hir original Hiroshima, and the second generation of Hibakusha,、uh, affected by radiation. And、uh, in the Yamaguchi Beach, there are a lot of、uh, waste, and digging that in and collecting them and、uh, pouring gasoline and burning them, it ended up like okonomiyaki. Like a pizza. And in a way, for him,、uh, it is uh, uh, the burning of the、uh, atomic bomb incident in his hometown、uh, from Hiroshima. And Gaho Taniguchi is her original.、Uh, her faction,、uh, it's a Flower arrangement faction called Ryu Seha, and she belongs to the flower arrangement. She came up with a very modernistic、uh, work, and we have tried to ask her to recreate that, but looking at the location with a window, she, was, the artist wanted to create something that really、uh, g i v e a message towards the future. So that is the reason why Sprouting Please is a title. And now going into chapter three, the great acceleration, and toward the、uh, end of the 20th century, there are a lot of human activities. And environmental issues, and many things are happening, and human,、uh, in terms of Anthropocene, is being created. And that in itself,、uh, in the chapter three, we decided to create the, as a title of the Great、uh, Exclusion. Gudrian s h a r i e l this is a, the explosion, and it is、uh, revolving reversely. So, human, the flame. It seems as though we're controlling them. But it, are we truly controlling these flames?、Uh, this is a question that is imposed. And also, Monira a r k a d Dirini. So, this is、uh, the disturbance, is a title. And、uh, if we trust it as it is, it's、uh, slightly different from the Japanese title. And、uh, this is、uh, Interim Culture Pearls and the Persian Gulf.、Uh, she's from Kuwait. And the oil are being linked together with cultured pearls. So, how it shines, it's iridescent、uh, in terms of the light. And at the same time, her actual, uh, the Kuwait、um, Gulf area, they are quite famous for natural pearls. And that created、uh, the wealthiness. But、uh, from the 19th century, 20th century in Japan, the Mikimoto, Kokichi Mikimoto, have c a m e up with a, a cultured pearl. And that has been developed. 
So the industry is going to fade, and、uh, for some time, the Middle East was really a poor country. Until the oil business is going to be on track, so her great、uh, her grandfather was a singer on the pearl boats, and uh, uh, she was born quite later. So that's why she was living in a wealthy time of the Middle East, and also、uh, let's say the shell, the Japanese shells, by having some nucleus, it will. Be Be dead.、Uh, so majority of those、uh, artificial pearls were dead. But uh, uh, so that's why、uh, this is a pearl dis- disturbance, or maybe the clutch. And also, this is a fruiting body by Yasuda Takeshi, and this is a marvel. Marvel.、Uh, so yes,、uh, the limestones of Nina Canal is becoming the marvels, and also the slag. This is an industrial waste. So there is a kind of、uh, industrial waste which is、uh, burned at really high temperature,、uh, became slag, and、uh, it will be. They are layered, and、uh, there are a lot of different、uh, time access or temporal access. Uh, to really view this、uh, fruiting body, this is a、uh, Daniel Turner, and this is a Japanese chemical tanker. This、uh, barometer varnish was melted、uh, to become a pigment, and this is a sculpture. This、uh, chemical tanker was dismantled in Alan in India, and、uh, things which are manufactured in developed countries are dismantled in India. So this、uh, sort of a structure can be seen, and also the uh, uh, this uh, Lebanese. Uh, this is、uh, Ali Shelley of men and gods and mud. And、uh, yes, uh, uh, when there is a、uh, soil and water were encountered, it produces human beings. So that's a myth. But uh, these uh, people uh, in working in this field are、uh, sort of inheriting that important. Uh, story. Uh, they are not just a、uh, poor and、uh, people, but、uh, they are inheriting uh, those uh, important myths. The number four chapter is a、uh, future is within us. So maybe from the digital innovation or maybe the feminism perspectives, modernism, and also the um, the um, First Nations、uh, perspectives. So this is the Agnes Dennis.、Uh, she is also important concept. Artist,、uh, it's a kind of a wheat field in Manhattan. So、uh, how the field is actually important even in the、uh, city, and also just. Gays within one kilometer from Lopongi,、uh, they are、uh, weeds, but it can be、uh, medical weeds. So、uh, Jeff was collecting those weeds、uh, to discover those. Of course,、uh, people who have money,、uh, they can actually go to the pharmacy to buy medicine, but、uh, people can actually use these weeds. This is a Kate Newby, New Zealand、um, uh, artist.、Uh, this is a called. Collaboration with our Hermes、uh, Foundation, and there is a terrazzo. This is a artificial marble, and from Mori、uh, Art Museum to Ginza Hermes,、uh, there is、uh, all those、uh, waste or some things which are actually on the streets. And、uh, Kate was picking up those、uh, waste、uh, garbage and created this art piece.、Uh, this is the Saijo Akane, the art. Artists from Kyoto, and、uh, they are actually having、uh, the uh, ceramics. 
And uh, this is uh, Marta Atienza, the Philippine um, artist. This is uh, Atroz Mega Manhattan 2022, Fisher Fox Day 2022. So uh, this is uh, trying to really in Bandayan. And this is for the fish people. They actually create a day for the fishermen. And now it's recognized as by the government. And also, this is a Shirawana Haki Wifi, and also uh, this uh, another artist, which is a Japanese artist, and also Ian Chen. Uh, this is a, a AI created turtle. Uh, this a turtle is reborn over and over. And this is the when we have the ecology as theme. The peel egg is really important artist. Uh, uh, this is Asado Raza's the Komorebi, the uh, dappled sunlight. And this is uh, for t t the uh, exhibition. The rose green, uh, the ceiling window was broken so he was repairing that uh, roll screen uh, to really make it as an art piece sorry I'm taking quite a long time but I think it's better for you to visit the exhibition so I hope you stop by at the exhibition and see the actual pieces thank you yeah thank you very much Reiko and uh, the next presentation is Yuko Hasegawa, as far as I know. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, once again, thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium. And uh, as uh, Tsubaki san and also Martin, and also the director, Mami Kataoka, thank you very much. I am actually a director at the 21st century of uh, modern art, Kanazawa. But as a researcher, I have been working and researching uh, this art and ecology for 15 years. So, how ecology has developed as a concept over years, and also how uh, we can actually involve ecology within the art art itself. So that's something which I'd like to share with you today. First, oh, yes, ecology, the term. This is uh, uh, actually coming from the uh, ecology. So this is based upon the science. So scientific approaches really started this uh, ecology. But it is uh, developed into the ecosophy. So it is now becoming uh, at the higher plateau to really uh, become this uh, uh, ecosophy. And this is uh, Pierre Felix Gattari. Uh, he was advocating three ecologies, social ecology, sociopolitical one, and also mental ecology. This is a mental or conceptual ecology. And the third is an environmental ecology, which is a natural science ecology, which is quite close to what we think as ecology. And number four is... Uh, information ecology, which is not explicit. So uh, there is a big inspiration to me when it comes to the ecology as a term. So you have to review you, where the surroundings, and this is based upon the ecology or ecosystem, and there is a relationship between different things. So uh, these are three ecologies have this, the arcs of artistic perception, processing, analyzing, and responding to sensory information through the language and skills unique to visual art serve to peel off the and deterior, deterior realize fragments of reality and partially recorded them. Uh, is a subset of the perceived of the world which is, uh, reinvents it with the meaning and heterogeneity. Art's almost animism method of capturing language results in the recreation of subjectivity in both the art pursuit producer and consumers. There are different methodology and also even technology is involved in terms of how we are going to really create the um, relationship. Another person 
which is inspiring to me, is a Tim Timothy Morton. He also is uh, having a radical uh, thinking from perception to sensing. And then by having a shift from perception to sensing, then I think the meaning of the environment is changing. So yes, uh, we are going to actually change from the uh, object which we have the sensitivity to the environment, which is ambient environment, which we encounter. Ambient means in Latin environment. So uh, this is what is not me. We can be non-human such as animals or maybe the objects or uh, robots. And by having the higher sensitivity, I actually change myself to adapt to those what is not me. And this is one of the inspirations to myself. And afterwards, uh, I have a dialogue with Mr. Martin, uh, Timothy Martin. Uh, with Alpha Erison, I had had the opportunity to curate exhibition. And he's also an artist and, uh, in terms of climate change and a place called Iceland, which is the second home. Uh, he has uh, visited uh, Iceland quite frequently and had been observing the climate uh, impact and consequences very closely. In terms of what kind of word or representative he uses, is water and light and also mist. It's uh, non material, but at the same time, it's something that surrounds us. And that is one of his way in representing his uh, art piece. And he himself, in terms of, uh, in, there is a place of empathy uh, in terms of the materiality. And it's a prerequisite for the creation of sympathic feel. This is advocated uh, Mr. Morton. And in terms of this common set of value, not something internal, but I have this sympathy or I empathize, I resonate. It's uh, not something internal, but it is uh, trying to look at it from the sharing of environment. And this was a new finding for me. So uh, Mr. Arrington at Tate, the weather project that he have launched, and something that altogether we're going to see the sunset. And sunset, of course, uh, there are a lot of memorable, of course, uh, illusion uh, effect. But that's not uh, beautiful as sunset, not that uh, empathy, but the phenomena itself, we have to be immersed in that phenomena. And that is, in a way, in a various uh, dimension, as Timothy was saying, it's uh, quite strong and resonate with what uh, Timothy uh, Morton has been advocating. All of you uh, object-oriented ontology, OOO. Um, I'm sure that you have had understanding from various means. So the word itself uh, is supersending the sensuality, in other words. So empathy, when we say empathy, uh, when we say empathy, is something that is sensual in nature, but it's not sensual. And so that is the most important aspect when we think about OOO. It's ephemeral. It's uh, the phenomena is going to be made into something material so that we will be able to see them. So it's deeply related with the sensing issue. So what I feel about the subject is to be shared amongst the other. And when you resonate, that is going to lead to empathy. And that's linked together. It's connectiveness, enhancement of concatenation. And in terms of information that's related to material, that information is a key. So in terms of various information, there are many ways to analyze them. And we look at the cloud and mist uh, in a naive manner. We have to think what the phenomena is. We need to analyze them, and we know what it is all about. And by very means of that, we can generate new knowledge. It's a knowledge production. So it's a creation of a place or time where you'll be able to observe, observe our pieces. So this is my area of my research. So with that being said, we had this done in 2017, 2018 in Moscow. Cloud Forest is the exhibition that's been launched. This is, in a way, as uh, had been mentioned, uh, the information ecology, as, and also as Katari has mentioned, and also in uh, Mr. Baki's presentation, uh, it's uh, connected to Earth and returning to Earth, return to soil. So what is the relationship with all that? So I think it uh, alludes to that very uh, notion, cloud forest. Cloud, of course, is a cloud computing, as you may know. It's an uh, online world. It's cloud, cloud tribe. Uh, we define it as cloud tribe. Forest, meaning that it's truly uh, the machine to metaphor, the so-called 
that on soil, on land, re- deep-rooted, their memories and tradition uh, that is deep-rooted to the soil, we respond to a third body and we accumulate our memories. So many of them, I think, are forest tribe. This is the, depending on the, uh, the generation 1995 with the advent of Internet. Many cloud tribe had been emerged, but those cloud people, by means of screen, by exchanging information, they are looking and censoring the world. And that is a wonderful itself in of its own, but body and the something that is indivisible. So how we are going to understand the reality? So to that end, on one hand, the forest tribes have a lot of information and a lot of connections are emerged. And on this land, I will be here. But then how, in a way, on the ceiling, on the cloud, how are we going to be connected? How can we connect with the others? So both end, they have a lot of desire and also interest. So therefore, I created this diagram. So this means that both end, they are earnestly wanting each other. But in the world, the methodology in accepting the world and receiving the world, how are you going to establish that and how are you going to share that? So new ecosystem will be brought about. So cloud forest. This is a circulatory uh, course system that I have advocated. So in terms of the forest tribe and cloud tribe are connected together. So in terms of information and environmental ecology, both are connected. So this is one way in order to, it's a thinking process of how it, this could be joined together, the cloud and the forest. I'm sorry, this is only in Japanese, so my apologies. So forest tribe, who are they? So they are uh, in terms of uh, the the proximity in terms of common land, climate, and also intermediary function, those are the peoples who are gathered together. And lifestyle and history and knowledge and aesthetics are all deeply embedded to each other, a group of people. And with the encounter of the internet, the new, of course, gathering place uh, are going to be seized upon or will be created. And that is one of the, of course, motive that they have to create that new place. So Patera Voska is a Scandinavian artist, so she with animal and plant, uh, creating hybrid of both. And she is a medical doctor, so very uh, scientific in her knowledge. Uh, this is Luna, who's a wolf, uh, and was a wild wolf, and the wolf uh, is tamed to her. It's a wild wolf, but Nazaria, uh, they, they, the wolf can coexist in symbiosis uh, with her alone. So there are a lot of discussion about this, but uh, the contact zone, in a contact zone, she is in an artist in that contact zone. So with that being said, one other, Bjork, Bjork is, as you may know, is a um, singer uh, in Iceland, and uh, she has broken the traditional framework. And in Iceland, the original uh, various methodology and how music is being composed, she's tried that out. So you may know what she's doing. So very mutation transformation is achieved around the world. She has created her own world. So Hyper Ballad, her uh, song title. And the image is that us are living at the top of the mountain. We see a beautiful view. Every morning, I'm walking at the cliff, and I throw things out, and into car parts, bottles, a fork, a knife, and something that lies around me. And I would do that before you wake up and you before you awaken. So I'm living uh, in a very happy uh, moment, being safe and secure. So this is a very ambiguous sort of a uh, sort of relic by Hyper Ballad, Timothy Morton, which I talked about, about the sensing, uh, a researcher in sensing, Timothy, and she was very much inspired by him. And Hyper Object is a book that he wrote. And it's quite interesting that for Bjork, he said that uh, send an email to Timothy, and Bjork had responded to the, the letters. Very interesting artist. And also the philosopher, there are a lot of exchange. So based on that, there are a lot of discussion that are being held and already being initiated and hyper object.
something that you cannot see in terms of the radiation, contamination, viruses, so uh, all the information around us. So there's something hyper is surrounding us. And how and in what manner are we going to reject or accept them? And where should they be? So this is a book that is written about the iceberg, as you've seen, tip of iceberg, you can see. And below, it's underwater. It's a huge, huge, of course, uh, a metaphorical image, as you can see, the, the the bulk of iceberg under the water. The next one is cloud. So cloud people, as I mentioned. So this is a post-internet generation, cloud tribe is different from the previous uh, generation in terms of their reality, mediality, and physicality. So when it comes to the physicality, they are now uh, trying to touch their ground for uh, having the cultural root. So they are now coming down to the forest. So not just the raider, but uh, they are now releasing themselves so that they can actually sense or douse the environment. And this is uh, new and this is interesting, which is different from the previous generation, the way how they use the internet, well, yes, uh, they are not connecting to the information which are, are providing the common information, but they are now trying to use the internet for uh, seeking for the random information. So the expression is a prehistorical uh, pictogram, or maybe the regression, or maybe using the magic of the algorithm. So there is a lot of different uh, methodology for their innovation. This is a French artist, Louise Du. Oh, hey. and uh, maybe the Yahoo or Google map and uh, their online structure or architecture are now described as map, which is quite analog. Well, you see this, you have this, uh, maybe by having this kind of analog way, you can understand something which is complicated in simpler way. Uh, this is a Valia Feti Sof. How many times do you interact with your friends through SNS? So uh, this is the number of the contacts per day uh, with friends. And this is uh, showing the different colors with different friends. Well, by having this, this is a graphical image of showing the interactions. And this is uh, Alexandra uh, Dizing. This is a scientist and also synthetic uh, plant researchers or um, biology researchers and uh, trying to have the bacteria which is activating the ground and this is artificial uh, bacteria and how this is going to work and this is based upon the research. And now, so cloud and forest. Uh, I have, I have uh, understood the relationship between cloud and forest. And coming back to Gattali's uh, philosophy, uh, now so through the exhibition, how we can actually uh, validate or verify the ecology through arts. So uh, we had this exhibition, Art and New Ecology, at Tokyo University of the Arts. Sorry, this is a eye chart, a busy chart. But uh, what this means is how we can comprehensively understand the ecology and art. Artists and also designers will uh, do the research and then observe the uh, art or ecology. And then they are kind of uh, having the roles as an agency to really bridge uh, between us. And it's not just uh, letters or characters, but maybe through that sensory learning, you can actually uh, come to the bodies or maybe awareness or sensitivities. So forest tribe, which are actually using the sensing in their surroundings, which is a micro perspective. And also by having a big data, this also have a certain influence onto our way of life, which is macro data or maybe the information, how we can visualize those big data, which is a macro 
macro perspective. By providing two perspectives, micro and macro, this is going to influence the way how we live. Once again, empathy is a key word. The role of art in the future, we now are divided, but now we can connect through the empathy and then even connect to the different humanities, including objects, including the animals. And that was uh, described as a first theme which Martin described or expressed. So non-humans, how we are going to interact with non-humans. And as a new humanity, maybe the multi-humanism can be uh, reviewed. We use the term humans, but it also includes maybe the agency such as the animals and also even the robots. If we think in this way, maybe the animism of Japan, or maybe the, the Dr. Dai or Nishida, or everything has a life, and then everything is connected. So this type of Zen uh, philosophy is getting closer. So in this regard, Japan can pr bring a one proposal. Uh, maybe it can be the philosopher or sociologist and also the uh, scientist. I think uh, together with artists, we can bring a new proposal uh, in the different uh, level. Maybe this is a great opportunity. This is uh, Marina Zelkov. She is actually living in uh, US, but she is from the Eastern Europe. And uh, she created this art piece, Mesocosmo. This is a video. So the ecologist, when they observe the environment, they actually have a certain scope of the soil, and then they measure over a year. And this is what it's called mesocosm. And this is uh, in Houston. This is the oil well. And uh, the soil is getting dent, and then there are small bonds, maybe it's a mixture with water and oil, and there are different uh, differences in terms of the four seasons. It's uh, actually created using the algorithm. So there are different uh, objects, organism, or maybe the uh, strange waste are coming up on the water. And this is showing a uh, year-long project. Well, using animation is quite important because if you see the animation, it's really understandable. When it comes to the paper, maybe uh, uh, you might find it quite difficult to understand, but you, uh, you know, viewing this uh, uh, animation, it's getting easier. So I think uh, this is a new media for the old viewers to really understand, and this is also important as a translator. So going to the next, this is uh, Ono Kansi, uh, the stu uh, student of the uh, university, and this is the uh, tsunami of tomorrow. So the uh, Nankai trough, uh, which is expected to have a big earthquake, and 2,000 kilometers he drove, and then using drone, he was shooting this video. Well, there are different data. Uh, the right-hand side number is at the highest level of the tsunami, how uh, tsunami is coming to the shore, uh, what kind of speed uh, it is coming. And this is based upon the collected data, so this is quite accurate. So when we hear like tsunami uh, by showing certain drawing, I think uh, this is actually uh, much better to understand. Maybe you cannot run, you, can, you, you have to drive. and. Uh, Maybe you can also have the eyes as a tsunami. This is also important because a tsunami is actually coming down to the uh, the shore. But uh, this is something which has which is coming because of the change of the nature. And yes, it's coming with the fish and others. And fish are actually dying because they are actually on the ground. Now, uh, those uh, all the big creatures which are left on the ground and died, uh, they, the human beings are not really talking about those. But of course, the tsunami is a big tragedy, but we have to also have the perspectives from the other side. And this is also one uh, role which uh, art can play. 
Oh, yes, this is uh, 30 sub thing, uh, meters uh, tsunami will, of course, go over 20 something meter uh, the uh, water brick. This is a uh, uh, Stefano Mancuso, the uh, researchers at the French University, and PLAN has intelligence. Plants can think about different things. This is one uh, um, uh, idea. And this is uh, the Fabrica de Aria, and uh, yes, using the sensor, and then uh, it's really showing the differences. Uh, and also, the trees are. Are talking to the people. And also the next one is a peanut, which is a think tank. And this uh, think tank is uh, having the video artists and also low professionals, designers, as well as the architect. And uh, the, in, uh, the knowledge about the plants, how uh, they can actually uh, bring those knowledge to improve the system or to improve the uh, environment. So in that sense, it's called Air Factory. This is the title of this work. So in actuality, in Falente, a large cigarette manufacturing plant, they created this big box. And it could be a, a cafe, it, it's a place where artists can work, but it's a huge place. And with a glass case, there are a lot of plants and botanicals. So, as you can see, uh, there are some filtering uh, of the pipes, as you can see at the top. So, the existing, let's say, uh, manufacturers, uh, so that the waste or water, or air purifier, you know the air purifier, but this uh, bacteria and viruses is all going to be normalized. It's a very thorough function uh, under perf performed by this uh, glass uh, cube. What's the clue is there is a soil, and there is a synthetic soil inside the box, and through the soil, it is going to be purified. So in various occasions, many other companies are implementing this because it's beautiful to see at the same time. I believe Tokyo office is also going to launch this uh, air purifier box. So in the future, I'd like to share this story with you. But how and what are the changes that we are seeing is quite interesting. And uh, also, uh, Professor Makudo is uh, very good. But when a curator like me uh, go to a scientist, they will say, oh, there's a curator not knowing about science. I had to start from scratch to dis dis to, know to discuss about this. Most of the time, we curators are chased away. But Professor Makudo said, oh, another curator is here. Thank you very much for coming and visiting. Very welcoming. The reason why is that he said for decades, he was writing papers and publicizing them and writing them on his publication. And he had written a lot of books. But a lot of world, no change to the world. And the vegetation in terms of the nervous system of the vegetation, how they are contributing to human and how we are coexisting together, how it is so meaningful. Okay, so I have been very much thanked by the scientists. This is uh, in the flyer, DXP exhibition, Digital Transformation Planet. This is an exhibition that is being appearing. Uh, and uh, the metaverse is creating a metaverse. It's a three trio and utilizing game engine, creating new visual is how they work. So the metaverse system, in other words, a certain level of, in other words, creating metaverse, their contribution, how one's world view are going to be created in metaverse. They're a presenter, and then those people can stay in the world of metaverse. So in other words, everyone, in terms of their intent, their knowledge, and all those are created by means of metaverse, and metaverse is created for that very means. So... One other thing, one more, of course, thing that I'm thinking is that in the past 12 months, we have been talking about AI, generative AI, in the past. We talked about non-human, understanding non-human. And through material, we wanted to understand non-human. And there are a lot of machines, and of course, uh, objects are included. But within this in initiative, well, AI is different from a human, it's a, but it's an agent. What are the subjectivity? What are the world? What are the information that they have? So we have 
have to review them. And in the world of singularity, that humans, the information collection and analytics uh, is going to be taken over by AI. We should not be frightened and feel as a risk. They are not tools. They are a lover or they are a companion. We need to live with them. So therefore, with them, we need to change because of the existence of AI. So AI alliance, uh, it is aligning with humans. So against this uh, trial, uh, we have to be critical. And with that being said, human, oh, we have a video here. So can we share the video? The Android, it's a Kono-san's work. It's auto couture. It's been created for this, and we commission this robot. And DXP is a, a coined word. And he or she is responding uh, to that. So chat GPT, GPT data, uh, all is, has been taught. So to that data, what do you like? It's a question, and then that Android could not answer. So there are six characters. So 10 years old boy or architect or musician, they would appear one after another. So it's a new machine that we see. And one more video. Uh, we are, I'm ending very shortly. So, okay, I should, okay, click, okay. So this is a tutorial video. So as you see, how you you can fly in the air uh, with the AI analytics, with that data, it's a tutorial video how you can create them. So by doing so, as I was talking, we say fly. But fly is a story that human created for the birds. It's uh, moving their uh, wings and it's their world. It's like walking in their world. So what is the thinking at that time? So we, for us to understand bird utilizing AI, it's a triangular sort of way of uh, sharing the understanding together. So that is my new thesis that we've been working on. So this is the exhibition as we are creators. So how we need to exhibit the art pieces, not just uh, looking at or understanding the artist, but uh, it's a mutual uh, reciprocal geolama that how we be able to present them from multiple angles. So this is something that we wanted to show. This is Forma Fantasisma. It's a wonderful designer's work. It's a uh, exhibition regarding lamb. So I'm sorry for a lengthy presentation, but this is what I have thought and still under consideration and under research. I have shared where we are. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for this time today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, now we right away switch to the presentation of shoes. So... First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. And um, I was yesterday in a conference uh, in Tokyo that started with the question, why art? That question, having been working with the question of nature and gender for very many years, is a recurring one. Why art? Why not information only or science? Or why is art and artists adding anything remarkable and important in the field of thinking about the future of coexistence and climate emergency? And I would say that the answer is because the paradigm, the change that we are facing is so big that we need to train our senses. So before we accept certain changes of logic, certain ways of thinking and we reverse them, our bodies need to absorb that change. So this change first gets accepted by our organs, our skin, our stomach, our cells. The cells get transformed and then we start thinking about it, thinking about how is an equal development of nature, technology and the human at all possible. I was very much inspired by a person that is from Japan, Minakata Kamagutsu, and uh, he was a naturalist of the end of the 19th century. I'm a little bit ashamed of talking about him in Japan, he's probably very well known to you, but he inspired me immensely. In seeing his work and reading letters that he wrote after returning from Harvard to Japan, he was actually explaining to a friend, how can it be 
that the Westerners believe in that pyramid that Charles Darwin proposed. How can it be? This is just not thinkable. How can it be that the human, which is actually the species less able and adapted to life, is actually put at the very top and every other form of life is actually at the very bottom. This makes no sense. We need to reverse it. And I must say that actually in Japan, it has been an immense amount of research into what I call subatomic agency. The possibility of microorganisms having agency and this agency being not only a metaphor or a poetic form of talking about their existence, but this agency as decision-making power. So uh, Japan has been uh, immensely researching like slime mold. You know, they are uh, microorganisms that can perceive a space. They can actually be in the space and they are, um, you know, they don't have any centralized form of intelligence. Also, they don't have any polycentric form of intelligence, but they understand the space and they connect and they connect in the shortest distance in that space, forming a web faster than the engineers that were planning the subway map of Tokyo. So this is really of radical importance to think about reversing ways of thinking and different logics that are going to affect not only how we think about nature, but how we think about our relationship to life in general. I also reject the idea of artificial intelligence. I think that it's much uh, useful to talk about organic intelligences in plural and expanded that notion to forms which are not only tools created by the human, but trying to enter into an era of non-instrumentalized technology. So a use of technology that is potentially not instrumentalizing it. So I am working both at uh, a university that I direct, it's an art school, and I think it's the only art school in the world that add to the curricula nature and gender. And I'm also the associate curator of a foundation that is both based in Italy, in Venice, in the ocean space, and it has a contemporary space in a classical museum of painting called the Thyssen in Madrid. So in 1982, scientists started to report something very weird happening in the coast of Costa Rica. All of a sudden, they realized that the coral reef started to bleach and turn white. They lost the color. So at the beginning, they thought it was an anecdotal situation. They did not give it much importance. By 83, um, they saw that this is not decreasing and it's not being anecdotal, but it's actually increasing. By 85, um, one night, um, something started to happen in, in the reefs of Jamaica in the Caribbean. 15 days later, the whole coral reef of Jamaica disappeared. All the colors disappear and they turn it white. One of the most exuberant, beautiful coral reefs of the world turned white. This was a disaster, ecological disaster, but it was also a cultural disaster. The people of Jamaica were singing for centuries to the colors of the reef. All the lyrics of the songs of the people of Jamaica made no sense because the corals were not there. Every tale, every story, every fable, every idea, every transmission of the generations had one subject, the beauty of the corals. It disappeared. So this drama that has immensely affected a nation, making them depressed, and also suppressing their folklore, suppressing their way of living, um, the way they fish, because the fish also disappear if the coral disappear. So um, it has been of immense interest to us. Um, we have been working with a Swiss artist called uh, Claudia Comte, 
which is here in the image. And then we tried to work both ways. First, going to Jamaica and uh, working together with um, uh, vernacular carvers. Since the coral disappeared, um, the many, the storms and the waves of the ocean started to be really heavy and it started to destroy also the forest that was close to the, to the reef. So the ancient trees started to die and the carvers of Jamaica rescue those trees that have ancient knowledge and started to accumulate them in a space in the north of the island. So Claudia went there and stayed there for many months working with them, creating a beautiful project that was a replica of the corals of Jamaica made with the wood of the trees of Jamaica, both dead but alive because she actually recuperated. So what you see here in this are corals made out of wood. Since there is an interconnectedness of life, we may think that something of the corals is living in those trees that are now acting as corals. This was a wall painting made by hand using bioluminescent uh, colors. So bioluminescent colors are the colors that uh, fishes are having to communicate among each other at the bottom of the sea. So it has been very recently discovered that actually because the human <coughs> eye cannot see in the depths of the ocean, um, actually we needed to develop cameras that they replicate the eyes of the fishes to see those colors. When those cameras were made, a man from the MIT and Harvard was making it, David Gruber. Then um, the camera discovered that actually the fishes, the turtles, and uh, the creatures possess immense amount of color and that this color is sending signals. So Claudia decided to do this wall uh, painting, actually um, replicating this color system, connectiveness way of communicating while we were also working with a lab in Miami um, that is trying to do an impossible task, which is to replicate the corals with uh, rapid prototyping in order for the corals to be replanted in the ocean. The corals are a symbiotic um, mix in between an animal and a plant. Because of that, they are very difficult to replicate. It's a complex system of life. So they have been trying to work with that and then trying to use technology to actually give the corals back to the ocean and replant it. So I am also running out of time, they say, but I would use that as an example of a complex, the creation of a complex system. A complex system is also what uh, Minakato Komagutsu was talking about when he was talking about subatomic agency. I don't know if you know, but there is these butterflies called the monarch butterflies. They are in Canada and for many decades, the scientists thought that they were dying in winter. So the butterflies actually, they don't die in winter. In winter, they start a trip and they go to Mexico. A butterfly dies every three days, more or less. It takes them three months to go to Mexico. It means that actually, um, every time the butterflies die, the next butterfly remembers that they need to go to Mexico and then they die and the next butterfly remembers they need to go to Mexico. So the butterflies that arrive to Mexico, they know that they left Canada to arrive to Mexico, but they are not the same butterflies, but they are the same butterflies because the memory is kept in all these individuals. So the idea of a system that in its togetherness keeps an intelligence and is able to perform a different logic is what gives meaning both to nature, but I go back to the beginning, it also gives meaning to art. Art is also that complex system, like the butterflies, we keep a memory of what needs to be done, and then we pass that mission from work to work, and we do exhibitions to actually enact 
that system so that our bodies and the citizenship understand it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in terms of the hierarchy you mentioned with the Japanese um, scientist and the pyramid, I just would like to add that also the tree of life, which was uh, made by Ernst Haeckel, who funded uh, ecology, the human being is on the top in the tree of life. And we should ask ourselves, uh, did that crown turn into an ankle bracelet or a bondage? Um, just as a little question before I now hand over to the next presentation of Nicola Burio. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, from my Parisian morning, I would be very happy to be physically in Tokyo, but unfortunately I couldn't. But I was, uh, it was, uh, I'm going to bounce a little bit on my what I heard this morning, which was uh, really uh, very interesting, um, through my own experience, uh, because I'm going to start uh, maybe with the cycle of exhibitions which concern um, ecology, um, which started um, 10 years ago, actually, uh, I call that the Anthropoc Anthropocene cycle, in a, in a way. It started with a, an exhibition uh, titled uh, The the Great Acceleration in the Thai, for the Taipei Biennial in 2014. Then uh, an exhibition called Crash Test, the subtitled The Molecular Revolution in uh, 2018 in Montpellier in the south of France. And then the seventh continent uh, for the Istanbul Biennial, um, which was uh, subtitled Anthropology of a Decentered World in 2019. And then the last one of this cycle of uh, exhibitions uh, um, was uh, in Venice last year, 2022, uh, called uh, Planet B, um, subtitled Capitalocene and the New Sublime. So 10 years after the beginning of this cycle, um, and uh, knowing that you know, we all actually interfed uh, by each other's exhibitions and works and uh, it's uh, becoming a very uh, fascinating network of uh, curators and uh, artists who develop uh, new ideas and new approaches to, uh, to the Anthropocene. So 10 years after the beginning of this cycle, I started to feel the, the necessity to work maybe on a different level. And um, this will uh, um, lead me to the Quanchu Biennial next year, um, which is called Pansori. Um, I will actually talk about it a bit later. But what I want to stress upon, and uh, which was actually very well uh, developed, you know, by the, my predecessor at this, uh, at this on this stage, uh, is the specificity of art, and I would like to come back on it, maybe bounce a little bit on what Chus uh, Martinez said about animal life, the, the, first of all, the, the specificity of art and why it's important actually to maintain this voice in the, the, the huge network of images and communication that we are invaded by today, it's because it um, also allows other ways of thinking and other systems of production of meaning, actually. Art, uh, it was said also, is not only information. It's not journalism, uh, actually. Uh, and even the activity of curator implies um, a different gaze on a given situation. And this situation being today global warming, for example. It's more on information. And funnily enough, the, the word information contains forma, in, which is in, in Latin means form. Um, art provides information in some ways, but in a very specific, on a very specific wavelength. And this wavelength uh, is form. It's a way to understand the world differently than the, the, um, the discursive uh, way. Uh, and uh, it may sound a bit banal, but you know, it's really important to, to remind that uh, today. Uh, exactly like if you have learned and can speak Japanese, it allows 
a way of seeing the world which is different from uh, being uh, speaking French, for example. You know, languages also are frames. And uh, I will start maybe with the animal uh, analogy that uh, uh, both Chus and Yuko uh, have uh, made before. Um, in my last book, Inclusions, um, Aesthetics of the Capitalocene, I um, develop actually the series of a Swiss um, zoologist uh, called um, Adolf Portman, who passed away in 1982, um, if I remember well, who actually studied animal aesthetics all his life. So he considered the stripes of all uh, mammal animals or the colors of fishes or the geometric design of seashells or the, the, um, the wings of the butterflies as what he called plastic formulas or plastic formulas of the expression of animal individuality, actually. So it's not, about, no, not all about species. It's also about individuality. It's important to understand that. According to Portman, feathers or scales or uh, furs um, should be seen as what he calls organs of display. And it's, this expression is very interesting related to art, organs of display, what we call skin appendages also in the zoologist. Uh, uh. So Portman invented a kind of uh, a science what that he called uh, phanerology and phanerology you know um, is the science of displays produced by living beings actually i just found a, a quotation from a portman that expresses very uh, clearly his research i quote uh, from adolf portman all creatures endowed with a relation to the world also possess the characteristic of self-representation, which has too often been unrecognized until now. It's the parts necessary to the relation to the world. And those parts necessary to the relation to the world are fashioned each time according to a peculiar, peculiarity, which is typical of the group, a singularity that expresses itself through many structures and many modes of behavior whose specificity cannot merely be explained by the simple conservation of the individual or uh, the conservation of the species. Self-representation, in other words, the presentation of an individuality through visual forms in view of communicating. So it, it seems that human art, actually, uh, what we are talking about today, also belongs to a much vaster world than the one we reduce it to. First, uh, biology, uh, of course, which is the inscription of visual appearances within life itself. And then metaphysics, ontology, if you prefer. But because in both cases, those inscriptions go beyond the notions of survival or organic function, uh, even. So uh, maybe uh, this comparison between non-human animals and human animals, because that would be the way to, to put it, if we are you know, serious, uh, is a way to introduce to um, to our thoughts about the, the, the Anthropocene today. Um, beyond the effects of the Anthropocene, uh, which I prefer to call Capitalocene, actually, that uh, uh, the expression invented by Andreas Malm, which this actually is more related to a, an economic system than to the species itself, actually, which I think is a much more fair and much more accurate. Uh, Beyond the effects of the global warming that you can see and check in the news, um, what I'm interested in in this cycle of exhibitions is the way those effects are um, perceived, seen, analyzed, and uh, uh, by the artists themselves today. I think the, the Anthropocene has an effect on the way of perceiving, understanding, 
and representing the world, actually. And that's where, where form is important because it's a more inclusive way of thinking than, um, than uh, dis the discourse, the verbal discourse, let's say. Exhibitions are also the, the place for confrontation of um, informations, which are global, uh, with the aesthetic language, actually. And uh, that was the core of the exhibition I curated in 2022, which was called Planet B, if you want to pass some uh, images of it. Which was a, um, an exhibition in three parts, a bit like an opera, actually, in three acts. The first one was uh, called Every Exhibition is a Forest, and it's about the idea of uh, semiosis. The second one was devoted to the structure of the coral reef we've been discussing uh, with, uh, with Choose. Um, and the third one was devoted to the, was called uh, the tragic death of Noru Island. Because Noru Island uh, was a perfect example of ecological catastrophe. But we can come back on this. Because the whole idea of the exhibition with these three parts was uh, to confront the very old notion, aesthetic notion of the sublime, uh, which comes from the, the, the 18th century, uh, as we know it, um, to um, global warming and the notion of catastrophe. Um, uh, I'm going to maybe remind the, the original um, definition of the sublime, according to the British philosopher Edmund Burke, in uh, 1757, he was writing, defining the sublime, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant, conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of sublime. What was in Interesting me in this exhibition was to confront this uh, this idea of a delight tainted with terror, that was the definition of sublime, with the anxiety provoked by global warming and by the ecological crisis. And it's interesting to take things from this historical level to see uh, how we can apply and maybe understand on a different level the problems of the present from uh, uh, theory from the from the past. Of course, we, if we talk about sublime, everyone in Europe at least would think about uh, Caspar David Friedrich, about the German romantic painters, etc., about uh, Turner also. Um, we, I tried also in this um, in this exhibition to to confront it with um, Chinese or Japanese landscape painting tradition, actually, and to differentiate it with the, the sublime, because it's a very different approach. But first, um, in this uh, show, um, what I wanted to, to say, um, using uh, and, uh, and to dial having a dialogue with the, with the artworks was that first, the, the sublime expresses a relationship between human beings and nature, and it involves their immersion in a landscape and an atmosphere. Immersion is the most important uh, word here. We cannot live anymore in a world where we are figure upon a background again. Uh, defined by Edmund Burke as um, a delightful horror, between uh, the translate sense of danger, actually, and loss of control uh, we are now experiencing with climate change. And also, it designates a realm of um, unbounded, out of scale force. Now that what the Anthropocene has revealed is precisely this crisis of the human scale. The loss of control of the human individual uh, and the feeling of being uh, without any control of his or her environment. 
And that uh, exhibition, I'm trying to, to cut it short, led me to my current uh, research for the Kwanju Biennial next year, which is going to be about space. You're going to tell me space is a very banal theme. It's super common. It's a, it goes without saying, actually, that uh, art uh, describes uh, spaces. But that's precisely because it's a very common theme that I wanted to address it. Because a, a, a quantum physician or any one of my neighbors here have something to say about space from their own experience uh, of it. Nobody really matters in a way so about space in art today. That's why I wanted to, to go into that direction to um, try to, um, yeah, almost having a structuralist approach on, uh, on what's going on uh, today. Because what we neglect uh, sometimes is the fact that was reminded by uh, Claude Lévis Strauss in uh, the early 1960s that art also as a function, which is not so often discussed, which is according to, to Lévi-Strauss, to um, help us to inhabit the world. Uh, Lévi-Strauss was saying that impressionist paintings, for example, was a way to um, introduce the fact that nature was not anymore um, an a wrapping um, element, like in the in that, the, still, the the landscape paintings of the uh, 17th century, for example, if you take a Dutch paintings, uh, you have Ruisdale, for example, which is uh, which who paints a um, huge uh, deserted landscape in a way. Uh, the impressionist paint pieces of nature, quite small which are already invaded by human constructions. And then Levi strauss uh, adds that the next step was Cubism, which um, was in even smaller scale, actually. It was only about uh, uh, cafe tables and uh, super cultural elements. There's no nature anymore in Cubism, almost not known. And then uh, in the 20th century, artists um, tried to escape from the coordinates of space and time through abstraction. So there's always a strong link between uh, the art of one, one time and the space in which the, the human species is uh, inhabiting. Uh, and that's this um, intuition of Levi Strauss that I want to pursue also in the in the Kunju Biennial. Because what's important to me is that every representation is a construction. And constructions, mental constructions, are actually um, informing and underlying all human actions. So understanding in which way our representations are biased or wrong or going into the wrong direction is a very powerful way to influence human actions for the future. Maybe I'm going to stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for these four very, very different perspectives about how we as art professionals, but also as art institutions, um, how we can deal with that what is called a global environmental crisis. And um, I just would like to remember that there is a German philosopher with the name Hans Jonas. And in 1979, yeah. he was speaking about a so-called ethics of responsibility. And his yeah. thinking came out of the peace movement, mainly. So he was actually also afraid that uh, uh, human economic activity and also human war activity, as we see it unfortunately again and again, that it would have disastrous consequences for the planet. Art, or let's say aesthetics, is, as we 
both all think is a subdiscipline of ethics. So my question to the round would be actually if this situation, this global situation which we have today, does it serve as a common denominator in a world which is more and more falling apart? And I would like to, it's, a, it's two questions at the same time, but I would like to ask or start with asking Yuko because she needs to leave at uh, seven. So, if you, you remember, <laughs> yeah. Hi, あの、and I can do it at uh, until uh, seven, uh, ten past seven o'clock. Um, sorry, あの、質問、質問がマーティンさんの質問のパートっていうのはどのパートだったんですか。What's your sorry? I just could you clarify what your question is? Question was actually um, if if art as a part of aesthetics, which is part of ethics. Uh, if the if the environmental crisis situation if that uh, if that gives something like a common denominator to the world to a world which is falling more and more apart because it's very polarized on that side of the planet in india you have a lot of people who want to modernize it's the largest country on earth in terms of population they want to have climate control they want to have they want to live a very modern life at the same time we are here in the 53rd floor in a very in a climatized space and we speak about um we speak about slowing down so my question is what can art contribute in terms of ethics or aesthetics in in creating a common ground Thank you very much. Uh, this is a big, big question. Well, when it comes to the ethics, well, this is a human ethics. So this is something which is for human beings to survive. I was actually studying law. So yes, the maybe the justice, equality, equity, and also uh, things which we have to comply with uh, to have the social li life. But going beyond the society, uh, we need to really uh, survive. I think uh, we will not kill each other. Ethics is a big issue, so it's really difficult to answer in a simple way. When it comes to the aesthetics, of course, aesthetics is different depending on the location, so I think uh, there is no common denominator. Well, justifying life. Well, maybe there could be one common denominator for living life. Let's say the maybe the peacock, the male peacock is enticing the female peacock. This is something which is uh, trying to provoke uh, the other. Well, uh, this is leading to life. This is leading to the survival. So this is one of the uh, aesthetics. But uh, I think uh, the way how the aesthetics is, is something which we have to think about. Maybe, well, from the aesthetics perspective, it can actually lighten the life. Uh, maybe uh, death uh, or death decadent is something which we also have to think about. Uh, if there is one big foundation, maybe the ethics and aesthetics are going to lead to one big foundation. How the different uh, perspectives or sense of value, how we are going to use the common language to really um, talk to the people. Maybe that is the role played by our artist as well as curator because uh, curators are now uh, trying to collect things from different locations to bring to something somewhere else because Martin you are from Germany and uh, you are having a lot of uh, different things from German to Japan well there is not really a common uh, understanding or aesthetics uh, between different countries but curator is trying to bring the art pieces into different uh, different 
locations to really demonstrate the beauty. As was mentioned by Nicola, the uh, role of uh, our curator is uh, trying to really work with artists and also maybe getting the feedback from the viewers. So this is a continuum of creation of different pieces. The format of the art pieces is changing and how those art pieces should be re received. Well, Nicola is talking about form, but maybe trying to influence the uh, people. It's not just a simple object form, but uh, maybe this is one meaning of how we can actually bring the um, different perspectives to the people. Through the form, art is going to create meaning. Art is uh, able to create the continuum of function as well as meaning. I don't know if this is answering to your question, but in this regard, well, you know, even though we know each other and uh, Ukraine people know who Larsen is, they actually have their relatives in Russia, and why are they still having the conflict? You know, why information is so pervasive but still having a war or a conflict? I think uh, art cannot solve those big issues, but toward the survival, toward living, toward living together. Maybe this is one insight of life. Maybe we can activate the insight or maybe trying to understand the other life. So maybe through the aesthetics and also ethics, we are able to really lead to that, maybe going beyond the economic topology. I think uh, the moment which is requiring art, this is a huge divide, and this is because of the information and capitalism and also other person as a capital person. This this is attributed to these development by human beings, and we all understand that. So based upon that understanding, using art, how we are going to make step by step? I think we have heard a lot of different ideas, and uh, yes, in a sense, based upon those different understandings, how we can leverage art, how we are going to live together with art. So that is the understanding or the uh, intelligence which we should all have. And uh, I think uh, this is not a concrete answer to your question. I think uh, uh, I have 10 more minutes uh, to stay, and I'd like to hear the others' opinions as well. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if Shus would like to comment. Yes. Um, um, to start with, I, st uh, I agree when Nicola said that there is no more natura mort, and the uh, common ground is natura mort uh, somehow. And I think that it's very important to drift away from terminologies that have been coined in the Western cultures, and they, they talk about articulations of uh, subfamilies, like for example, aesthetics being uh, together with ethics. It's interesting that it, it serves a purpose for a while, but I don't think that we can even use those terms anymore uh, in the kind of constellation we are talking. I've been very interested by uh, Edward Wilson, who wrote a book in 98, talking about another term which is consilience. Consilience is a term that started to be used at the end of the 19th century, and that in Latin it, it means concilient, like uh, the idea of jumping together. So I do believe that there is no common ground, but there is a together jumping of knowledges. Wilson was actually very important because he did something that is radically and difficult to think if you are a human, which is, he said, that the genetical evolution of every form of life is actually jumping together, is actually acting in parallel. It, this means that he is reducing the human and the traits of the human to its uh, organic function, like any other form of life. And therefore, in this reduction, we actually gain a connectivity, a synchronicity with the rest of the forms of life. So the only way of not being patronizing and not thinking that we protect nature. First, we have the agency to destroy it, then we reverse that agency and we protect it. So we 
uh, perceive something as sublime or aesthetic, it means our centralized system as humans perceive it that way, may have nothing to do with the rest. This idea of continuously transferring how we feel to others, perceiving animals as artists, uh, doing this type of exercises is still very dependent on the European sciences of the 18th and 19th century. Um, I think that this concilium, this jump together, this idea of a, a brutal quantic entanglement of every form of life and how to understand that. And I do think that art is actually serving the purpose of intuitively helping us to understand that. An understanding that will arrive to language, let's say, in 100 years, perhaps, but doesn't matter. It may arrive to your stomach, it may arrive to your skin before. This is uh, what I would say the common jump. Yeah, maybe Nicola would like to comment on that or add something, especially also in the knowledge that you said there is no, no outside anymore. So if there's no outside anymore, can the artist still take the position of an outside as, it, as, as he, she did long time ago? Well, the, the outside is pretty difficult to find nowadays. It comes under the, um, the fantasy of uh, Elon Musk thinking about uh, going to another planet. But except from that, you have another expression of it, which is uh, uh, the interest artists have for shamanism today, for example, which is another type of travel. And you have the uh, micro, uh, the molecular world, actually, which is the, the, the micro worlds, which are also kind of outside. But except from that, you know, it seems that the human beings are trapped in the system they, they built themselves, um, actually. Um, concerning what, and, and if we actually uh, want to go further into that direction, it's important to understand also that um, it's not uh, animals. I agree with uh, with with truth. Actually, uh, it would be a terrible illusion to think that animals would be artists. Uh, but human art is a subdivision of a global semiosis. That's a thing that would be a better way to to, to put it. And we have to think in terms of this global semiosis and not exclude uh, other species for this. Um, that's also, in a way, with this uh, inclusive way of thinking I'm trying to, to, uh, to, uh, to assert. Um, I would also say, Martin, that uh, ethics could be considered as a subdivision of uh, aesthetics. The, exactly the same way around, actually. Uh, ways of being, ways of behaving are also formal decisions. Um, they are also representations of ourselves within an environment. And in this way, they are formal and they are aesthetics or possibly judged as aesthetics. So we could say that ethics is a philosophy becoming a form of life. Um, um, and also then becoming a way of perceiving the world. And that's the definition of aesthetics, the first uh, etymological one uh, of, of aesthetics. Um, and into this world, uh, it's really important to acknowledge the agentivity of artworks themselves, actually. The, the, the uh, anthropologist Alfred Gell uh, wrote a really fantastic book about the agentivity of um, of artworks in different civilizations and the way we do actually acknowledge uh, artworks as the representation of someone, uh, um, a being we can enter in dialogue with. And I think that this interaction is just the basis of all our works, which is uh, also to take care of because a curator comes from the Latin cura, or take care, actually. And this care, within a dialogue with the artworks is also um, showing a world made of interactions with, and those interactions are um, also um, an ethical element. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation, which I would like to expand a little bit to, uh, you talked 
and transform it to a question to Reiko, because before you you quite often used the term Kapitalocene. So you, you're not really speaking about the Anthropocene, but rather decided it's the Kapitalocene we're living in, which oh. gives responsibility to a particular idea of finances, which in the meantime is actually a uniform uh, the, or the, the only way to exist on this planet, obviously, somehow. But it ne needs difference as nothing else. Capitalism needs difference. Uh, difference is the, is the food for capitalism. And uh, this is something Raiko reminded me of. So how do you think can we get out of that? And what role can art play? Well... I pointed out, but I don't have a question. I don't have a you know answer. But uh, mm, no, just you know, like uh, globalization or this cap capitalism needs always this small difference to exchange. To you know, it's like like uh, I don't know nine dragon with a nine heads, and uh, taking like different type of the. Encountering a different uh, differentiation and uh, absorb into that, you know. So, just, but uh, I think, you know, what we were talking, I hope it doesn't just to emphasize this kind of capital sin, it's to give the more different type of the, you know, status where we can exchange the things and have the different idea or, you know, yeah, and, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> No, no problem. And um, since it would be also wonderful if we have a little bit of time to talk amongst others with the audience, I have one last question before I, because I also felt that there was a bit of dissens about it, and that's namely the role of technology. I had the feeling that we have different ideas about how to use technology. I rather felt a very kind of emphatic and affirmative view on new technologies and AI on the side of Yuko, but I had the feeling that Shoes was a bit uh, skeptical about that, no? But maybe you could, you can comment about, about uh, the, the relation between technological innovation and social progress in the framework of this ecology theme. No, thank you for the question. Once again, if I can respond in Japanese. Well, as uh, Tsubaki-san, Reiko mentioned about the uh, capital law saying, uh, I would like to talk about capital law saying, uh, and like, if I can comment, frankly speaking, it is an optimization issue. In other words, art is more or less is avoiding optimization. It is one cycle behind. What kind of detour can you take and can we achieve soft landing? It's a, a coordination and harmonization. Of course, there are criticism added to that, but we ha cannot live without capitalism. And then what is capital in that case? So social uh, common capital, how we think about capital uh, in terms of shifting to aesthetics and a sociological aspect, we have a function to redefine that in that manner. And the other is that in terms of art, art is in terms of it's uh, a, a art that is joined together is to communicate and to represent. Various technology techniques have been utilized in the past. So therefore, uh, paint, and the uh, Frick Anadol has a, is an artist is utilized DXP is an exhibition Anadol is utilized know how human know how and also in terms of the brain exhibit brain wave brain wave and noise are being utilized and utilized algorithm brain brain wave and new form is being created and me creating a relief is talk so it's a brain wave art. So based on that, the base original idea is the uncle of Alzheimer, and uh, there's no response from the Alzheimer ankle. And one of the sensuality to, to give stimulus, he thought uh, to the uncle, and art is not art first, but art is it, it, ex expanding to new technology. is a ways of means of what the artists want to really reach out. What is the reflection of reality? How could that be represented? And the messaging of that. And that is one way of how technologies are utilized. So art
artists utilizing AI and new technology, embracing them, harnessing them. I'm very positive about that. Moreover, technology uh, in terms of optimization of capitalism, it could be abuse against abuse usage. We need to rectify that, always rectifying the abusive use of technology. So artists with new technology, AI, expanding the wings is important. So they, it's a not one-way acceleration, disruption, uh, it's, it's a break, stopping that. And also, in a way, the humanity, in the area of humanity, in terms of the life that we do have, it has a purpose of bringing us back to us. And in terms of interpreter and translator, so it has a way, the means of rectifying the situation. And in technology, that's a really important role to rectify them by means of metaphor, by means of philosophy, inclusive all of that. How technology could be leveraged and utilized is a new way of using technology. It's a different way of utilizing technology. So in terms of capitalism, optimization, it's just the opposite of that. And that is going to be represented. And it may not be useful, but if what do we mean by not being useful? That is an important thing that we need to think, think about. So unuseful thing. Many efforts are 